Good morning, everyone. Hello. Hello, those of you tuning in from home. Glad you could join us today. Today I'm going to start us off with a brief reading from Scripture, Psalm 62. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? Would all of you throw him down, this leaning wall, this tottering fence? They fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Low-born men are but a breath. The high-born are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together, they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or take pride in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard, that you, O God, are strong and that you, O Lord, are loving. Surely you will reward each person according to what he has done. It's a, for a lot of people in the world, it's a tough time right now. It's a tough time for people who can't afford the things that they used to afford. It's a tough time for people who are living in difficult political or even military situations around the world that are costing people their lives, costing people their livelihoods. It's, it's scary. Um, but for us, as we look around us, we have reminders of God's love. We have reminders of, of God's power. We see the miracles that God puts in front of us every day. And we choose to see those miracles. We choose to look at the children in our lives and think about the life-giving nature of God. We look at the world around us all in bloom, and we appreciate that, that force that he has in the world. And So today, as all days, we are called to respond to that. Uh, we are called to look upon the miracles around us, even in really difficult circumstances, even in difficult situations around the world, we're called to look and see the miracles that God has put in front of us. And so... Today as we worship, uh, join me as, as we look to God and say thank you for what you've done. Thank you that even in difficult times, dark times, you are a God who loves. You are a God who demonstrates his power and his mercy among us. Uh, we're thankful for a lot of, you know, being together today. We're thankful to have the Frasers back after a national lampoon-like vacation across the U.S. Uh, we're still in prayer for Todd and Lisa as they traipse across Europe with 26 Milligan students. And we're just full of life here today and uh, thankful to be gathered with you all. Uh, so let's stand and, and worship and uh, let Joe lead us. And I search the world But it couldn't fill me And man's empty praise The treasures that fade are never Put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you Better than you, there's not. 
to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn Scripture this uh, morning is from Acts, chapter 20, for, yeah. for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, 
and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit to you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You may be seated. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this I plead, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. If you will bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you humbly and in awe of your beautiful creation. Mornings like this remind us of the beauty of your goodness. It reminds us that storms will come and go in this life, but your glory remains forever. The coming of spring reminds us that the winter is just a season, that the days of darkness turn back into days of light that the deadness of the foliage around us comes back to life as well, and that you are the giver of life, and you can take anything and bring it back to life. And we pray that um, you would capture our hearts, that you would take our hearts of stone and make them, and make them back into flesh. We pray that you would lead us together as a community and individually. We thank you for this church. We thank you for this town. Thank you for all the families that are here. And we thank you for the bl many blessings that you've bestowed on us. Father, you, we pray that you would be here with us today and speak to us in the way that we need to hear it in our hearts and in, as a group, we pray that we would leave this place today and have our hearts overflowing with your goodness and your love and your joy. We pray that we would also be a light to those around us, that we would be the salt of your earth. We pray that you would hear the thoughts and the cries that are in our hearts as we mourn for people around us who are dealing with loss and uh, hopelessness, 
we pray that you would hear our prayers for those who are sick and those who are grieving. And we pray that um, you would help us to rejoice with those around us who are rejoicing and celebrating. May we come together as a community um, with hearts ready to join with one another in interconnectedness. We thank you for the provisions that you've given us, and we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. Be with us as we continue our worship together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Most of y'all probably know, uh, pretty much aware that I spend a considerable amount of time uh, coaching girls softball, and I talk about it a lot too. I've already, <laughs> I've already spent some time this morning with Ron, uh, chit-chatting about softball, uh, one of the things we both like. Um, I coach Olivia in both little league and travel softball, and uh, one of the things that I constantly drill um, into my girls and constantly remind them is the importance of the little things. Um, the majority of the time, games are not won with grand slams and home runs, dingers as the kids call them now, um, or you know, a pitcher throwing a no-hitter. Uh, most of the time, games are won by doing the small things well. Uh, you know, Making good throws and good catches, backing up your teammates, uh, reading signs from your coaches, um, being aggressive. Um, and you know, life, or the Christian life, uh, really isn't much different. Uh, faithfulness doesn't always look like, uh, you know, grand displays of generosity or service or extravagant worship services or any of the other bars or limits that we put on ourselves or tell ourselves that this is what being a good Christian is. Faithfulness generally in, in the Christian life is about the small things, uh, the day-to-day -day decisions that we make um, ourselves and as a congregation, how we relate to others. Um, but much, much like my softball girls, sometimes we, we tend to disregard these small acts, these small decisions that we make, um, especially when it's something we do every week. Um, that's one reason why we have meditation is to, to direct our minds and our hearts uh, to what we're doing. Um, because communion, you know, it's a small act. It takes about 10 minutes from start to finish. Uh, it's not flashy, it's not complicated. Um, but it has monumental importance. Um, when, we, when we come enter this time um, with our hearts prepared, uh, it has the ability to influence every decision we make the rest of the week. Drawing near to God as a body of believers um, can, can't, it can't do anything but transform you. Um, to remember Jesus for his life, death, and resurrection and that our creator, God, loved us so much that Jesus came to this earth. Um, that transformation and renewal is, is amazing. Um, it can invigorate the body and, and edify each other. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful to be here this morning. I'm thankful to share this meal with you. And um, I'm thankful that we can worship God together. Give us
Father in heaven, <clears throat> we are so grateful for your love, the love of all of your creation, Father, so much that you want to redeem it. Father, we thank you for your presence in our lives, a presence that brings to us a fullness of life, a fullness of life, Father, <clears throat> that's only possible when we are freed from sin. And Father, it's only possible for us to be freed from sin because you loved us and you sent your Son from all his glory in your presence to this earth to take on flesh and blood like we live. And Father, he was tempted in every way that we have been tempted and yet he lived a sinless life life and father it was that sinless life of your son that became the perfect lamb the perfect sacrificial lamb father the price to be paid for our sin and he willingly let his body be nailed to that cross and his side to be pierced and the blood to come out so that we might be forgiven. And Father, it's that body and that blood that we remember now as we partake of this bread and this fruit of the vine. In Jesus' name, amen. On that night, Jesus celebrated the last Passover with his disciples. And during the meal, he took the bread. He broke it, blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body given for you. disciples <clears throat> said this is my blood of the new covenant given for the forgiveness of many take and drink Father, as we continue in our worship, we now do so by 
sharing our resources with you. Father, we share part of our money resources with you to continue the work of, of this congregation in your kingdom. But Father, we also take time, Father, to give you ourselves, remind ourselves who we are and who we serve, who we trust, Father. Father, you taught the Israelites of old not to, not to appear before you empty-handed because you wanted them to learn not to be ungrateful, to realize that all, all came from you, everything, Father. Our very lives, everything that sustains our lives, all of creation. And Father, since then, <clears throat> you have given us so much more through the giving of your son, Father, the sacrifice that forgive us of our sins. So, Father, help us to grow in our response in love to you by being generous as we share with others through our offerings the gospel of your son, Jesus, and as we care for those who are in need. Father, that all that we do might bring honor to your name, a name that is above all names, Father, a name that is eternal, a name that will bring forgiveness and wholeness and peace to those who serve you in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As the kids head downstairs, I wanted to make one quick announcement, which I neglected to make earlier, and that's that we have a guest preacher with us today, Ron, our good friend Ron Marvel from Etches, here to deliver our message. So, Ron, I'll hand it over to you. It is good to be back with you all. Um, I didn't realize until talking to Andy that there was about a four-year gap in between my coming and being part and sharing, and uh, now I've had an opportunity to be here uh, twice in the last two months, so that's, that's exciting. I was so glad to hear about the opportunities that Todd has, and you know, he's going around some of the places that he's going to be going to between London and France and Italy, and I, I walked back there and I saw that him and his wife, it's their anniversary month. And I was like, that is so cool. So this is like an anniversary for them. And then I just heard 26 college students. And I thought, man, this is not an anniversary at all. I, I never will forget. Andy, you can identify with this. I, I came back at the time I was working at Southside. Had a good relationship with all of my elders. But I got back after a week of camp with about 110 uh, third through fifth graders or third through sixth graders and had an elder come up and say, well, how was your week of vacation? And I thought, boy, 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 you've never been to camp, have you? It's a lot of things, but a week of vacation, it's not. Um, I, I do want to give you just one very brief, before I jump into the sermon this morning, I do want to give you one brief um, update on Etcha, just because I know that some of you were actually there last week. 
Um, we had our benefit concert, bluegrass, barbecue, gospel, bash, and between that and the letter that we sent out, we have to this point raised over $32,000 for the ministry and for the families there that we help in the community. Um, so share that because you are a church that supports us in a, in, in a great uh, way. Um, this morning is kind of different. I'm not here to, besides that little bit, I'm not here to talk about etch. I actually really want to get into God's word. And my hope this morning is that this is a time of encouragement. I, I do want to share something with you. And this is uh, something I found um, on the internet. Uh, Bill Gates came out a couple weeks and he said this, the next pandemic that we have will be 10 times worse than COVID-19. And I examined that statement for a moment. Then I asked myself, who is Bill Gates? Is he a disease expert? Did I miss something? Who knows exactly who Bill Gates is? Yeah, he makes computer software that doesn't work half the time or forces you to go buy updates. That's who Bill Gates is. Like I said, he's not a disease expert. So why would they, I mean, it was all the major news sources, why would they go and quote Bill Gates about the potential of a next pandemic? Well, see, the media knows very well, very well, that fear sells newspapers. Fear gets you to tune in. And the darker and the more hopeless the story is, the more glued to the TV set that we become. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Peter this morning. And we'll be looking at chapter 3, verse 13. I've, got, I've been blessed with a fairly loud voice, so if I step away, can you all still hear me? Okay. 1 Peter 3, verse 13, it says this, Who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Fear is a real thing. We live in a world where terrorism, threat of war, and the constant threat of biological or chemical or nuclear extinction is right around the corner. Folks, it's so difficult for us as the church to sing songs like victory in Jesus and power in the blood and my chains are broken when we allow fear to dictate our life. When fear is so present, we can't have hope. And our fears and our worries can just overtake us. And once we allow them to creep in, they're so hard to get rid of. I'm going to tell you a story. One time I had an old garbage can. And it was bad. I mean, it was rusted. I had used it to burn some garbage in. The bottom had, fell out, had fallen out of it. I went one week, and I was like, I'm just going to get rid of this thing. So I took it to the road and sent it out with the rest of my garbage. I figured the garbage man would come by, he'd pick it up, he'd take it with him. My son made the mistake of putting another bag of garbage in it. So the garbage man comes, he lifts out the garbage bag, he takes everything with him except he leaves this old can behind. I was like, okay, I can, I can fix this situation. The next week, I set it aside next to the rest of my garbage by itself, the garbage man still leaves it. The next week, and I kid you not, I can't make this up, I take a bat, softball bat, old softball bat, and I beat in the side of this thing. So it's almost caved in. The garbage man comes and he kicks out the dent and leaves the garbage can. I got to thinking about how I could get rid of this thing. I live in Carter County. I shouldn't say that. Um, well, I, I live in Carter County. You do with it what you want. I took it out near the side of the road, and I swear somebody stole it. That's how I got rid of it. Fear 
worry, stress, once you allow it to creep in, it's hard to get rid of. The hope that I can give you today is this. God never changes. Amen? We need to fight our fears, our stresses, our worries by hanging on to that essential truth that our master never changes. Our mission never changes. And praise God, the message of the gospel doesn't change. What we need to do today is to claim the Holy Spirit in a mighty way, not only to deal with the major fears that we have, but also the fears that we deal with on a daily level, the fears that we constantly battle, fears of being rejected, fears of being judged, fears of failure, and it goes on and on. Fear is such a weird emotion, and there's a wide spectrum of fears that we face. I looked up some fears and phobias this week, and I'm going to read a couple and see if you can guess them before I tell you. Nonophobia. My daughter has this one. It's the fear of losing your cell phone. Boogie phobia. Can't make this up. What'd you say? Yes, you got, yeah, how'd you know that? Very good. You may have this one too, lachnophobia. It's the fear of eating vegetables. Yeah. I almost hate to mention this one because it's going to affect some people in here. But Philadelphia phobia. It's the fear of bald people. Yep. Triskaidekaphobia. Thirteen. Good. Yep. Fear of fear of the number thirteen. How about this one? I think this is one that we all have from time to time. Phobia phobia. Yeah. Simply put, very real fear, it's the fear of fear itself. For so many of us, that is our biggest fear. We simply become obsessed with those things which may or may not happen. We allow our minds to work and they go to the darkest, most bothersome place. I was out sharing in a church Um, near um, Memphis, Tennessee, and um, met the great-grandson of Black Bart. I I didn't know it until after the fact, because there's actually an illustration that I use um, about Black Bart. But he came up and introduced himself, and he's like, the the media tells one story of Black Bart. There was a completely another side of Black Bart. But for those that don't know, Black Bart was a professional thief whose very name struck fear and to those who traveled on the Wells Fargo stage line. Usually that travel would go from San Francisco to New York. His name became synonymous with the dangers that people faced in the Old West and on the frontier. Between 1875 and 1883, he robbed 29 different stagecoach crews. Now, amazingly, Black Bart did all of this without firing a shot because he hid his face behind a hood. No victim ever saw his face, he never took a hostage, and he was never trailed by a sheriff. Instead, Black Bart would later say from prison that he didn't need to fire a shot. Matter of fact, he was considered a gentleman robber because he wouldn't allow anyone to cuss in front of ladies. He said, that all he had to do was use fear and it would paralyze his victims. Now we have a modern day, believe it or not, we have a modern day superhero that is based on Black Bart. Does anybody know who it is? Say it, it's Batman. Yes, Batman was faced, you guys are very intelligent. Batman was based off of Black Bart. But Black Bart said that fear The face of the unknown was his weapon of choice. An intimidating voice is how he would get by. A sinister presence and the threat of words with a dark, deep voice was enough to overwhelm even the toughest stagecoach guard. You know, I read that story, and I want to tell you, church, Satan is exactly like that. If he knows that he can't have you back, What he's going to do 
is he's going to want you to allow worries and stress and fear in this life to steal all of your joy. Because if you have no joy and you have no hope and you go around as an old preacher one time looking like you swallowed a pickle sideways, then simply put, you're going to be ineffective when it comes time to share the gospel. Now, we looked at that passage in 1 Peter 3. We see three things there as we talk about fear. First of all, Peter says that the suffering that you're going to have in this life is inevitable. It's going to happen. Secondly, you're going to find yourself often in situations that can be intimidating. And finally, understand, folks, that you have a solution in the midst of all of this in Jesus Christ that is infallible. Now, simply put, fear is going to be something that each and every one of us will experience. Experience fear, after all, is just a normal part of life. But, and this is a very, very big but, I want you to understand, we should not be kept from serving God because of our fears. The scriptures, the scriptures even teach us and go as far to say that the very life of Christ can be made manifest through our fears. That is, us overcomplishing or getting past our fears will bring him glory. Look with me at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 17. I'm sorry, in verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the body of the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be also revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death, for Jesus' sake, so that this life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore, I've spoken with the same spirit of faith. We also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. You getting past your fear brings glory to the kingdom. As we look back at that passage we first read in 1 Peter, the first thing we see is that suffering is going to happen. Here's the basic principle from Scripture. The person who suffers trials and persecutions in this life will be blessed by God. So you may be wondering, how can a person who endures suffering consider themselves to be blessed? Well, let me back up for just a moment and say this. The person who places their focus on this things, on the things of this world, and places their value on the things of this world can lose everything. That person can be struck down with disease. They can suffer a heart attack. They can go through cancer. They can have an accident. They can go through bankruptcy and lose everything. When you become a person in this world who puts all their stock in just this world, then you will set yourself up to live a life of fear because all you have in this life is this life. So when this life is threatened, you often become gripped with fear. And that person who places all their stock in the world will do everything they can to hold tighter, to protect it. An old saying goes that God can't bless a clenched fist. What a sad existence that is. No hope, no future. Instead, those people live a life of constant fear that something's going to come along any moment, any day, a crushing blow that will take away their possessions, that will take away 
family or title or position or some material thing that they've worked hard for. That a day exists out there on the calendar in the future. You don't know when it's going to come, but it's looming. That day when you're going to find yourself hopeless and helpless in this life. But the good news is this, church. A child of God lives a different life. Amen? Because they're not focused on the things of this world. They're not focused on those material possessions or those things that are temporary. They're focused on the eternal person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, no matter what that person fears or suffers or goes through, the object of their hope will not fade. They know instead that Christ will take care of them whatever comes their way. Turn over to an earlier chapter, Romans chapter 8. Now, you're probably familiar with this passage. It's used a lot, but it's good to go back and look at these familiar passages from time to time. For the sake of time, let's go ahead and pick up in verse 31. It says this, What shall we then say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who shall then separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through, whom, through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus Folks, if that doesn't get you excited, if that verse doesn't put a smile on your face, you may need to check whether or not your heart's still working. It doesn't get much better than that. See, a child of God has that confidence. He has the confidence to know that God is faithful, that they will not be forgotten, that when God makes a promise in Scripture like he does right there, that God's going to keep that promise. So how this works in regards to those promises is this. The key becomes giving God authority in your life. Giving God those fears, those struggles, those worries, those anxieties that you have. I want you to consider a partial list of the promises that we have in Christ. And I'll be more than happy to share these with you after the service. Matthew 6, says this, God will provide us with all the necessities that we need in this life. 1 Peter 4, 4 says, God will give you his glory in the face of insults. 2 Corinthians 4, 11, the life of Christ is being made manifest through us in fear and suffering. Matthew 5, 11 through 12, God provides great rewards for those who stand in their fears and suffering. 2 Timothy 4 8, God will preserve us and take us to heaven as we stand firm against those worries and fears and in the midst of our sufferings. And by the way, this is just a partial list. I could keep going on and on and on. These promises are here for you to take in this life. Now, this is the real important part that, part that I want you to hear. And I pause for just a moment because I think it's so important that we understand this. I don't want you to be confused when you hear these promises. Nowhere in scripture does it say that your life is going to be free from suffering or trials or fear. That promise is made nowhere. The difference is when we make a choice to stand firm on God's promises and believe that his word is true, then God will bless us. I read an interesting autobiography. I'm trying to finish off an MDiv I started years ago. and I'm writing my final thesis for it right now. 
A part of my reading for that was to read the autobiography of a lady who lived in western New York. Her name was Nancy Fye. And Nancy Fye, one morning, getting ready to go to school as an elementary teacher, got a nosebleed. And she couldn't stop it. She tried everything, and the blood wouldn't stop flowing. She eventually had to go to a doctor that day, and what they discovered was there was cancer in her sinus cavity. And it had spread from her sinus cavity to about half of her face. The only way the doctors could save her life was to go and surgically remove half of her face and the bones that were involved in that side of her face. In the midst of her suffering and pain and conflict and stress, she writes a book simply entitled Be Strong and Courageous. If you've never read it, I'd give you an opportunity or encourage you to go read that. But in the midst of her suffering and in the basic, the backbone of this book were four resolutions that she determined. It's a small little book, probably no more than 70 or 80 pages. But she said these four things, and I share them with you this morning. She said, first of all, moving forward, that she would no longer complain in her life. Secondly, she said that she would be determined every single day to keep the witness of Christ strong in her life and to share it. The third thing she wrote was that every day she was determined, moving forward, that she would get up and start each day writing her journal, counting every blessing that she had. And finally, she wrote that she would use the suffering and the fears and the pain in her life to try to bring those people that she came in contact with to bring them to Christ. Now, she had fears. Because in, in her book, they gave her essentially a 20% chance to live. So I'm sure that she had fears. She was a mother of three young children. But what a great message that God can take our weaknesses and turn them around and use them for his glory. My second point this morning, and I'm almost finished, we're going to find ourselves in situations that are intimidating. Understand this, and this is what scripture says, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. That word fear in the Greek is translated phobio, and it essentially means to be alarmed or to be in awe of something and to allow something to intimidate you. And that's precisely what fear can do if you allow it. It will intimidate you. If you allow it to run its course completely, it can destroy your life. How many of you have ever heard the expression that the word fear not or be not afraid appears in Scripture 365 times? You ever heard that before? Okay, we've got several in here. I actually looked that up. That's not accurate. It actually appears 366 times. Isn't that amazing that God even gave us one for those years that we have leap year? Zig Ziglar said this, he said, fear is a false evidence appearing real. We often run from the imaginary just as Job lived. He said this, that which I fear the most has come to pass. Now, I'm going to tell you that some fears are legitimate. They are real, and you're going to have to deal with them. When I was 19 years old, I went and I'm actually originally from Delaware. I went down to Chattanooga and played baseball down there. The first time that I drove on I-95 in D.C., I was scared to death. I don't know how many of you ever rode that or not. It's the United States equivalent of the Audubon. People get on there 85, 90 miles per hour, and nobody checks. You just go. It scared me to death. Some fears are real. We've got a gym up on our campus, and... Um, we find all kinds of creepy crawlies in there all the time that just come and like to live. Um, there was, one time we found a baby bat, which was kind of cool. I didn't let the girls touch it, but there was a baby bat in there. But spider wolves, I don't know how many of you are familiar with those or not, but they're very large spiders. Th those are just up there all the time. Those are typically the spiders that you hear when you go out to the garage running across the cardboard. 
That sounds like little people taking steps. I, I leave, for the most part, I leave spider wolves alone because they eat more than basically what they take in. And spider wolves have never bothered me one time. Now, I'll show you a picture up here. I think it's up there right now. Andy's brought it up. Like I said, spider wolves never bothered me much until I saw one just like this about a month ago. She had babies all over her back. And she, and some of you are squirming right now. I can see you. She wasn't moving at all, but all these little babies were just crawling everywhere. And it looked as though she was moving but standing still at the same time. I have to tell you, that kind of freaked me out a little bit. Fears and stuff like spiders like that, but that was kind of bothersome. I'll tell you one more story. I am a, um, primarily a child of the 80s, but also the, the 70s. And for those who were around back in the 70s, which there's a lot of you, we as a country, for some reason or another, became obsessed with Bigfoot, even more than, than Bigfoot today. And there was this movie that came out when I was in second grade, maybe. I still remember this, Andy. I was obsessed with Bigfoot. I just There was a Saturday morning cartoon where Bigfoot would come out and play with this other kid, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. This movie that I went to was rated PG. It should have been rated PG-13, but at the time they didn't have it. But I begged my dad, I begged my dad to take me to this movie. In the middle of the movie, I never will forget this, this Indian boy is playing. And out of the blue, Bigfoot comes. And he's angry and he's growling. I don't know why he's mad at this Indian boy, but he chases him for a couple acres. And this Indian boy just eventually finds a place to hide from this very angry Bigfoot that's going to hurt him. Now, this was the complete opposite of the Bigfoot that I had come to know and to love. And that concerned me a lot. The next day, my dad, we had this, we kept all of our garbage out in the garage, and my dad would have me run it out there. Oh, and it was probably two or three hundred yards away from the house. And I start to go out there, and all of a sudden I start hearing this howling and this beating of like wood and sticks together and just growling. Oh my gosh, I threw the garbage in the woods and took off and just ran in the house and started screaming for my dad. And my mom said, you're going to have to leave your dad alone. He's got a headache right now and you can't talk to him. I found out years later that my dad was standing on the porch when I was in the back woods and he was growling and howling and clicking sticks together. That night, the my fears got the better part of me. And that's what fears do. If we allow them to, our fears can run just completely rampant. And our minds will go to the very worst possible scenario that we can find. I'll give you another fear that I can tell you if you're living your faith outright may be a very real fear in your life. And that is what other people will think about us if we genuinely get on fire for Christ and what that's going to look like. Look with me at Psalm chapter 56. Psalms 56, and we'll start in verse 1. David, of course, here speaking says this, be merciful to me, O God, for men hotly pursue me. All day long they press their attack. My slanderers pursue me all day long. Many are attacking me in their pride. When I am afraid, I will trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? All day long they twist my words. They're always plotting to harm me. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, eager to take my life. On no account let them escape in your anger, O God. Bring down the nations. Record my lament. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this I will know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. In God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can men do to me? I am under vows to you, O God. I will present my thanks offerings to you, for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. 
we become fearful of what other people think. We become fearful that people won't think we're normal. We become fearful that people are going to misunderstand us when we start to genuinely live for Christ. Or we become fearful that people are going to think that we are a self-righteous group of elitists. After all, every person in their very core has a need to belong or a fear if they don't. And I think when we look at that earlier passage from 1 Peter, that's one of the things that Peter addresses here. He basically tells us as the church, do not be afraid to be sold out for Christ. It is worth the potential risk of you being misunderstood. The Christian who is committed, who lives a godly life, is going to face the fear of rejection and intimidation. Because we live in a culture that's going to try to tell you there are no moral absolutes anymore. That everything is just gray. That all truth, after all, is just subjective. But when you are completely sold out, and you do not allow your actions and your fears to come in conflict with one another, then you can become the person that God desires for you to be. Let me close this morning by saying this. The solution that we have is infallible. Thomas uses this word. We only see it one time in describing the Lord. And it's the word chorios. It essentially means supreme authority, master, set apart as Lord. It's interesting in the midst of Thomas and his doubting that he would use this word. I think it's extremely appropriate for us today to look at Lord in that role of chorios. That it's that person I'm going to allow to have control. You see, we have no need to fear when we put Christ in the proper place. In 2004, a Gallup poll showed that 78%, 78% of Americans, oh, sorry, 2014, showed that 78% of Americans expect to go to heaven when they die, but only 26% say they ever pray, read the Bible, or ever attend church. And Christians wonder why their lives are so filled with fear. So how do you know this morning whether or not you've genuinely set Christ apart? A.W. Tozer said these words. He said, those people that have set Christ apart have three distinct marks in their life. First of all, they only face in one direction. Secondly, they never turn back when fear and worry in this life starts to show itself. Finally, that person who has set Christ apart does this. They are always determined to make their plans the Lord's plans. The second part of the solution we have is to cling on to God's word. Simply put, it's scripture-based education. And Peter says that in the passage we looked at earlier. He says, always be prepared to give an answer. We call it Christian apologetics. Be prepared to give an answer for your faith. Keep in mind that Satan is a liar, and his desire is to overwhelm you in this life. But when you put on the armor of God, as we see in Ephesians chapter 6, then we can prepare when Satan starts telling you those lies. God today, he's looking for people, waiting for people to seek him out and to live fearless lives. A life of spirit-filled dedication that's based upon spiritual education. Let me read one last passage to you. As I come down, as we get ready for our time of look with me at Joshua chapter six. Joshua chapter six. I don't know if it's on the board or not, but we still got the spider. said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hand, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the
the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets and ram horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout, and the wall of the city will collapse, and the people will go up every man straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and have the seven priests carry trumpets in front of it, and he ordered the people, Advance, march around the city, when the armed guards go ahead of the ark of the Lord. When I look Thank you, Ron, for that message. At the end of our service each week, we offer an opportunity to respond. That's a lot of what Scripture is, is God giving his people an opportunity to respond, to invite them to embrace what he's calling them toward, a, a, life, of, a life of hope and someone driving very fast by the church. That was, that was alarming. Um, but no, offering a chance to embrace that hope, a hope that's greater than fear, greater than the fear of the unknown, greater than the fear of suffering, greater than the fear of, of being different. God gives us that chance to respond, to respond to the good news that we have in Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that we're going to know everything. It doesn't mean that we're not going to suffer. It doesn't mean that we won't have fears. We still will, as, as, as Ron talked about. But it means that those don't matter, or at least that they matter far less than what we have to embrace in the life of Jesus and the hope that we have in him. So if you haven't made that decision, if you haven't chosen in your life to embrace the good news in Jesus Christ, we invite you to do that this morning. If you have made that decision and you'd like to reaffirm that, or if you'd like to, to talk about or pray about the ways that God's working in your life, we'd be happy to share in that with you as well. If you're looking for a community to worship with every week, um, we'd invite you to join us. Uh, we are called very clearly in the New Testament to be a church and community, uh, to gather with other people and to, to worship, to support each other, to, to celebrate with each other, to grieve with each other. Um, we'd love to share in your life with you. Uh, as uh, Joe plays our closing song this morning, I would invite you to come forward if you have anything that you'd like to reaffirm or affirm or if you'd just like to have someone to talk to. If, if not, in front of everyone, at least uh, talk to someone that you've seen up here on the stage this morning. Uh, someone in front, someone in the back, we'd be happy to share in those things with you. But uh, as Joe sings, let's join him. It's softly and tenderly Jesus is calling.
Thank you again for gathering with us this morning. Before I close this in prayer, a couple of quick announcements. One re reminder that our Wednesday night programs are on hiatus for the moment, including adult Bible study. Um, but there are going to be some events coming up throughout the summer for kids and youth, so be on the lookout for announcements for that. would we'll also invite you to our Sunday morning Sunday school. Um, we're wrapping up Exodus maybe next week. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how much progress we make. Uh, if history is any indication, we won't be, but we'll see. And then we'll be starting into Leviticus soon. Um, so it's an exciting time. It's not all just going through the law, although that's a big part of it. Um, there's a lot of really powerful narrative there, too. So we'd love you, love you to join us for that. Um, one other quick announcement. We're going to be getting back into a uh, ministry that we've done historically that was, was on pause uh, for COVID, which is our community to shut-ins program. Uh, we're going to be getting back into that soon. If that's something you would like to participate in, that is bringing uh, communion, the elements of communion, to those who aren't physically able to, to gather with us here at the church, talk to me. Let me know if you'd like to, to serve in that way or if you know someone who would be blessed by that. Um, we'd be happy to talk about that and include them. So if you have any questions about communion to shut-ins program, just let me know. Uh, we'll be starting that up in the next few weeks or so. Um, any other announcements before we close in prayer? Okay, let's pray. Loving Father, Lord, Lord, we, we thank you. Lord, even though we, we live in a world full of sin, uh, a world full of reasons to be afraid, reasons to, to cower in fear, uh, Lord, to, to, to shield ourselves from your sight, which we can't do, but we try. Lord, even though there are so many reasons for that, Lord, you give us even greater reason to, to reach out to you. Lord, to, to look for, instead of for those things that bring us fear and concern and grief, to look for those miracles that you've put in front of us, the, the life that you've put in front of us, Lord. And we're, we're so thankful for that. We're thankful for your faithfulness in us, Lord, that we can see those things, that we can embrace those things, and that we can, you know, through teaching, through Ron's message today, through what we see in your word, that we can embrace the good news that you have, not just for us, but all those, Lord, who would... Uh, who would call upon your son as Lord and King. Lord, it's in his precious name that we pray these things this morning. Amen. Go in peace.